Welcome back to Mad Medicine. In this lecture, we're going to be talking about the hemoglobin dissociation curve and the properties that allow hemoglobin to be uh, such a good carrier for oxygen. Now, if you don't know, on our YouTube channel, you can find all of our hematology and oncology videos. You should definitely go check it out, YouTube forward slash Mad Medicine. And while you're there, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe to our channel. We post new step one videos every single day. So let's review hemoglobin really quickly, and then we'll go on to the curve itself. Now, hemoglobin exists in two main forms. You have the deoxygenated form, which has low affinity for oxygen. It's going to promote the release of oxygen to the tissues as well as being favored by the tissues. The tissues like the deoxygenated form because you're going to have increased release of O2. Then you have the oxygenated form. This form has a high affinity to for O2 due to positive cooperativity and negative allosteric of these two molecules, which just means that at the end of the day, once you have, let's say, two uh, heme molecules saturated with oxygen, the third and fourth heme molecule will get saturated much faster. So the more you have, the more likely you are going to become completely saturated. And the less, um, when you're letting it go, the more likely you're going to be to let go of oxygen when it comes to hemoglobin. Now, another thing to understand is that the oxygen form is going to promote the uptake of oxygen from the lungs, so therefore it is going to be favored by the lungs. That makes sense because the other one is favored by the tissues. Now, fetal hemoglobin is going to have a higher affinity for oxygen because it has a decreased affinity for 2,3-BPG. It's going to drive more oxygen across the placenta, and therefore it just needs to have uh, a higher affinity to, in order for the fetus to get the right amount of oxygen it needs. Keep in mind, lungs in the fetus are going to be uh, underdeveloped up until the very end. So right before the baby is born, their lungs are very immature. Therefore, the main way they can get uh, oxygen into their body is going to be through the fetal hemoglobin molecules themselves. Now, when it comes to the hemoglobin dissociation curve, keep in mind I wrote this whole uh, title in red. Well, this just means this is very high yield. You should have a good understanding of what's happening as well as what is going to cause a left and a right shift. So we're going to talk about that right now. Uh, so let's first talk about our hemoglobin dissociation curve itself. This is what the curve looks like. The green is a normal hemoglobin, adult hemoglobin uh, curve. So as you can see, you have this plateau that occurs really quickly, and that is just telling you, that just shows you the positive cooperativity. That's the whole reason. Now, the hemoglobin F curve is slightly left shifted, as you can see, and the myoglobin curve, we put this in here just for a reference, it is even more so left shifted. So what is this curve really telling us? Well, what it is telling us is at what percentage of uh, sorry, at what pressure of oxygen, what partial pressure of oxygen on the x-axis is our hemoglobin concentration going to be 50% bound? At what percentage of, uh, at what temp, uh, excuse me, at what pressure of oxygen are we going to have 50% of our hemoglobin bound to oxygen? So let's put this right here, 50%, okay? And as you can see, if we draw a straight line and we bring it down and we connect this to the x-axis, what we see in this case that let's say hemoglobin A, our adult hemoglobin, is 50% saturated at uh, a partial pressure of X. Okay? And then fetal hemoglobin is 50% saturated at a partial pressure of Y. And then myoglobin, just for reference sake, is 50% uh, saturated at a partial pressure of Z. As you can see, for fetal hemoglobin, it can become 50% saturated. It means it can become very saturated at a less partial pressure. So fetal hemoglobin has a higher affinity for O2, and we know that, and that's what this is showing. So when you have a left shift, that means our body is going to have a higher affinity for O2. When you have a right shift, you're going to have a lower affinity for O2. So what's happening? Let's just look at this really quickly. When you look at left shifts, left shifts are going to cause uh, are going to be because of decreased O2 unloading to the tissues. That means in any state, uh, these are going to be things that are going to favor O2. That's what's happening. Okay, so what's going to cause it? Well, it's essentially anything that makes uh, anything that causes our levels to go down. And what that means is right here. 
as you can see, the majority of the uh, the trend in a left shift is things are going down. So if you have a decrease in temperature, a decrease in 2,3 BPG, decrease in chloride concentration, decrease in uh, 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 proton concentration, a.k.a. an increase in pH. So a more basic, uh, basic si situations or alkalosis will do it. And then a decrease in partial pressure of CO2, right? That's because you are decreasing the unloading of O2 to the tissues. And in the right shift, you're going to have an increase in unloading to the tissues. So what's going to cause an increase in unloading to the tissues? Well, it's going to be a decrease in pH or an increase in hydrogen concentration, right? A increase in partial pressure of carbon dioxide, increase in chloride levels or chloride concentration, increase in 2,3 BPG, and a increase in temperature. Now, in this case, keep in mind that exercise and, al and high altitude are also going to cause high shifts. Okay, that's also what's going to happen. It's also going to cause a right shift. Now, the way I remember it is if you are looking at the x-axis, what is causing a left shift? Well, if you go towards the left, you are going down in numbers. And if you are going to the right, a right shift is going to cause you to go up. So as you can see, the signs should correlate. And this is a pretty easy way to understand what causes a right shift and what causes a left shift in hemoglobin dissociation. Okay. And with that being said, that's pretty much everything you need to know for step one. I, I understand this may be a little confusing at times, so I highly recommend you guys some time, spend some time with it. And this is pretty high yield because it's going to come back in both the respiratory systems as well. So keep a good uh, keep a good memory of what's happening here. And with that being said, thank you so much for listening. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe to our channel. You can follow us on social media right here at mad.medicine mad on Instagram and it's mad medicine on Twitter. And uh, if you guys don't know, you can follow and you can listen to these lectures on your favorite podcast. Just search mad medicine for free and we'll pop up. Thank you so much.